What is up, everybody? Welcome to Mags and Slabs. We got episode two. I'm Brad, and we got my friend Mike. Say hello, Mike. Hey, Brad. Hey, everybody. We are glad to be back here uh, chatting up about sports magazines again and, and CGC and everything related to the hobby. So we've got some topics picked out and um, we're just going to kind of uh, we're just going to kind of flow off each other and, and talk about these things that we love. So, um, Mike, before we get started, you got anything that you want to want to say? Um. We have a we have a, a good list of interesting things that we're going to chat about today. I'm I'm really excited about all of these actually, um, but uh, no, I'm just I'm ready to talk mags. Let's do it. Yeah, it's it's fun uh, going back and forth just talking about even what our topics are going to be, and I feel like we've already got such a long list, and uh, we we kind of go back and forth, and we put this list together, and we're like, okay, that's gonna that would be like three hours if we talked about all that, so uh we got to keep chopping it down and we've we've probably already got enough topics to to last 10 episodes but um that's just because we're kind of nerds and we like talking about this stuff but yeah first first topic that we got on deck is uh pretty relevant to what's going on right now i know i know a lot of other collectors have been having their eyes on this and that that would be the slabs that are currently up for sale on heritage and so I'm actually going to go ahead and and drag my screen over here so you guys can see a few of these these key ones. But uh, the the big one is obviously this Michael Jordan, A Star is Born 9.8, Michael's first pro cover. Um, and you can see the current bid already. And we've got, what, 12 days to go is $44,000. And that's without the buyer's premium. So if you're watching or listening to this and you're not familiar with Heritage, um, you know, this bid price is not actually the final what they call hammer price of of what the buyer is actually going to pay. There's a buyer's premium. And I think that extra amount is is a lot of the cut that goes to Heritage. And so I know with the buyer's premium, this this guy is up right now, I think around fifty three thousand dollars. If I actually clicked into it, it would show us. But um, yeah, over 50 K already for this Michael Jordan magazine, which already establishes it for sure for the highest record sale for a public magazine. We do, we do know that there was a private sale a couple months back where a Wilt Chamberlain 9.4 first cover went for 60 grand. Seems like there's a really good chance that this, this magazine is going to pass that up as well, but for sure it already holds the record for highest public sale. I think this is surely going to break that record of 60. Um, how how high do you think this might get? I don't know. It's tough to speculate because, you know, I've seen I've seen auctions, obviously, where at the last minute there's there's huge jumps. Yeah. But yeah. I've also seen there there are some instances where those high bidders get out in front earlier or get out in front early and then it, it just kind of sits at where it is. So, I mean, it's not it's not out of the question to say that it stops here and that you know, the final price is whatever, 53,000. I, I think it's going to go higher. I mean, when you think about that Nintendo power first, uh, first cover 9.8, that went for 108,000 on heritage. Um, you know, I think that that really set an interesting precedent. If, if someone really forced me to make a prediction, um, I'm gonna, and I, I hate to do this cause I, you know, I just feel like I'll look stupid if it goes way under or way <laughs> over, but I'm going to guess that I think it's going to go around 75,000. Yeah, I could see that. Here's another question. Do you think once this makes its record sale, does this affect like its hierarchy with the 1983 cover? Does this maybe dethrone that one as like kind of like the flagship Jordan issue in some ways? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I think the so the the 83 jordan i don't think there's a 9 8 out there uh, out there on that no, one I is there 9 6 i think is, is maybe the yeah. highest yeah 9 6 is the highest on that so in my opinion the 83 jordan first cut cuz cuz this a star is born cover that we're looking at with the bulls that's his third cover um and so yeah. the one you're talking about that first one with in his unc jersey with sam perkins to me that one is still a slight notch above this one, like just as far as collectability and cover, but as far as what's out there graded, 
I think that this 9.8, and I think there's actually three of these 9.8s. Um, I think that a 9.8 of this, A Star is Born, is probably higher than the 9.6 of his first cover, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I think you're probably right. Um, yes, I'm trying to see what the pop is on, on his 1983 cover. So I think yeah, I think if a nine point eight ever did pop up on that eighty three, I I think that would sell for more than whatever this one goes for, um, and especially like I said, this uh, a star is born. It's a pop three. There are three nine point eights, but uh, if if one of these if one of his first covers ever popped it, it would be it'd be a pop one. So yeah, yeah. What are the chances of that actually existing in the future? I I don't know. It, it's I I think it would be surprising. Here's the yeah. here's the pop report on the uh on the 83 on his first cover. By the way, CGC Comics new little logo there. I just noticed that today when I was playing around on the census. Um yeah, so there have been 116 total copies graded, 112 of which are universal. And like you said, Mike, there's there's one nine point six holding up there the highest, and there's only one nine four, and then there's only two nine twos. So um, you know, this is a really tough issue because it's thick. Yeah. It was the basketball college basketball preview. It's also got the gatefold. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I was looking because I got one right behind over my shoulder. It's got the gatefold. So and it's got a lot of the you know light blue ink all over. So and then I know the back of it's got black ink. So yeah, it's, it's super tough. And if you've got a nine point, if someone's got a 9.8 of, you know, a, a, a magazine that old, that thing had to have been stored intentionally, right? Like Absolutely. you're, you're not just going to find one that someone had laying in a box and stacked with all their other magazines for all these years. That's going to grade a nine, eight. Um, so to me, I feel like most of those people that intentionally, went about keeping a newsstand that nice. First of all, there weren't very many people doing that, but I think that most of those who did it have kind of already become a little bit aware of this hobby and, and would have likely sent it in to be graded by now. That's just kind of a guess. I would guess that too. I'm, I'm now curious when this issue was slabbed. Uh, well, we could, reason, yeah, I think we could find now. out actually let's, here we can maybe we can maybe educate some people here on on how some of this works. Sure. So let's look in. Let's look at this. Um, let's I, look closer at this issue right here. I'm yeah. going to zoom in. And like this is. No, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, yep. you're good. Let's look. Let's look at this. Okay, so there's the cert number, and I'm going to go to CGC lookup, and here we can check out the. Uh, we can type this cert number in. So let's see what we got. 422-958, 422-958, and then uh, 3001, 3001. So we're going to look up this specific slab. And the grade date was, yeah, April of this year. So and what was... If if this magazine could talk, you know, like what was the, what what is the life of this magazine? Like you said, it had to have been very intentionally, you know, stored safely for decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow, it's just amazing that a, like a pristine example is just now graded like this. And this thing's this thing's beautiful. Yeah, it's flawless. Yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty fun. So yeah, fifty two eight with the buyer's premium is what it's at right now. It's it's gonna be pretty fun to see what it does over the next twelve days. I've been keeping. I I think I mentioned in the, our first episode. I had a subscription of this that I bought. Uh, this had to have been the late nineties or something, and I kept that pretty safe. I mean, it's a subscription, but I kept that safe and. That thing got a 5.5 recently. So, <laughs> wow. I mean, that shows how hard it really is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think some people don't realize how hard it really is to get these in such high grade, especially for me, anything before like 1990, any Sports Illustrated before 1990, 
um any 9.8 is insane like it's it's hard enough to get one on a modern issue but uh yeah it really blows my mind that there even are a couple 9.8 to this do you another another thing that might break the internet is if there's ever a 9.9 .9 sports illustrated graded yeah that's a good point um i was looking at that data the other day and there's there have now been over 18,000 Sports Illustrated copies graded and still not a single 9.9 .9 or 10. Um, and you look at the comic world and it's very, very rare. But uh, I actually I actually looked at the numbers. I can't remember what it was, but uh, there were thousands of of nine nines, I, I think. Um, mm. maybe, I don't know. Maybe I, I probably shouldn't say that without remembering and looking off the top of my head. But yeah, we still have not seen a single one of. I'm a little of surprised that. I'm sorry, but I'm a little surprised that there has been a Wimbin Yama 9.9. .9. Yeah. We'll that's... talk about that issue later, but yeah. I mean, I don't know. Mike, do you have like a Barnes & Noble or, or anywhere near you where you've been able to go pick up the like the newest releases of SIs? Um, yes. In fact, I picked up two Wimbin Yamas out of a giant batch that was actually in a newsstand, a newsstand uh, books, like a bookstore um and i found two of the whole batch that look gradable and they did get a 9.8 hmm. but um yeah that's that's yeah. what i was gonna say there's there's a barnes and noble near me and uh the times that i've gone and looked at the the recent issues that i have an interest in they're so beat up like none of them look to me like they're going to be 98. I think I, I grabbed like i grabbed like five of the julio rodriguez first cover several months back um because he was one i i really felt like had great potential down the road um but really even even the five that i picked up i just they almost looked to me more like nine twos i mean because there's just a lot of damage from all the all the shipping i guess and all the handling oh definitely yeah i mean out of that huge stack most of them seemed ungradable to me yeah so of these other issues, I mean, there are a couple, obviously, obviously the Michael Jordan star is born. That's the story, but there's a couple other pretty key ones up here too. And one thing that I, I just want to mention, cause this has really kind of been driving me crazy is what, what is heritage doing with these estimates? Like who makes these estimates? How are you telling me that? I mean, I think it's fair to say, okay, 30,000 and up for the Michael Jordan nine, eight. I think that's a fair estimate, but but you're telling me that you think the nine, six miracle is going to be 40 and up. Like mm -hmm. I'm not buying that. And then over here, 10,000 and up for the Gretzky. And I guess, I don't know, maybe there, maybe that's going to turn out to be pretty accurate, but the last nine, four Gretzky that sold went for 30 grand. That was the, the next thing I wanted to bring up. Yeah. The, this is going to, uh, this is going to show like a very vivid um, illustration of, of a market declining a little bit for some of these big issues here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you're always going to see, not always, but I think in many cases you're going to see when you have first to market, it's going to probably realize a higher price than maybe the next few. So like that Gretzky nine, four was one of the first to market in terms of major issues in really, really high grade. And and it went for thirty thousand. Um, we're now seeing the second Gretzky nine four, and as you can see on the screen, it's it's right now just above eight thousand, probably close to ten when with the buyer's premium, or it might be above ten uh, with twelve days left. So still could get to thirty thousand. It's definitely not trending that way right now, but um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see where the second one goes as opposed to the first. And and another really good example. I actually just filmed my I just filmed today my uh, highest magazine sales from July. And I talked about this, that uh, the Kobe 9.8 first cover sold on Heritage last August for 8000. And then another 9.8 just was on Heritage last month. And it went for a little over 2000. And so I think that was a perfect example of that Kobe 9.8 from last August was the first to market. And so there was a lot of interest, but yeah. right now there's not, there's just, there's only really a handful of 
super high end buyers with that kind of buying power in this hobby right now. Definitely nowhere near the level that there is in sports cards. That might be a more important factor than anything else right now is which of these mega collectors have already filled that hole. Yeah. Um, the the Wayne Gretzky, I mean, the, the 9.4 is not even the highest grade for that. There is a 9.8 out there that would probably have a huge price tag if that ever, you know, went to a public market. Yeah, and I think that one, is now. that 9.8 might be the one that some people were messaging me about that, like, no one knows who owns it. Oh, interesting. Like most of these, most of these key covers and the really like the top grades, you know, like we just mentioned, there's really only a handful of big time collectors right now. And so I could, you know, I could tell you who owns a lot of these best copies. I think it was the Gretzky. I had, I had a guy, I had one of the high end collectors messaging me several months back and he's like, Hey, do you know who had you like, Hey, I know that this person, this person, this one has this one, this one, this one, but we have no idea who has, and I think it was the nine, eight Gretzky. So that's kind of interesting to me how there may just be some sort of random unknown person out here holding one of the Holy grails. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the, one of the grails of the hobby for sure. So yeah, these, uh, these are all ending in 12 days. It'll be really cool to see where they end up. Um, another thing that I, I meant to look this up beforehand, the nine, four Gretzky, um, that went for 30,000 last year. I think that was January of 2022. So that's been like over a year and a half now, but was that one bought by collectible? Like the, uh, Oh, I believe you're right. The fractional. I believe it was. So I wanted the fractional groups. I forget exactly which one. Yeah. I remember seeing that collectible bought one and I just can't remember if it was, if that was the exact same one or not. And what is the health of collectible right now? Are they still doing their thing? I'm not even sure. Um, no, I think it's bad. Yeah, so that might tell a bit of a, its own story right there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I think Rally Road is still, you know, doing their thing. But um, I think collectible, if I remember right, um, I think like just a month ago, I saw some some articles about them mm -hmm. basically. I, yeah, I don't even know if they're still going, but it didn't. It sounded kind of bleak. Yeah, I think I remember hearing that too. Another thing in this auction that I find interesting that there's a handful of of uh, subscription issues, though be it big issues such as the Pele and the Trout mm -hmm. that are have pretty healthy bids here. Yeah, yeah. This this Trout nine eight is a blank box subscription, which you know I think is is a slight notch above the traditional subscriptions. Without you know, doesn't have the address actually printed in there and. You do have a bit of 2000. I think it's, I think it's very interesting. This is, is again, like, okay, heritage. Mm -hmm. Can you guys please learn how this hobby <laughs> works? The, the 8,000 legit newsstand sold or the, the legit newsstand nine, eight sold last year for 8,000. So you're telling me that you really expected this white, this blank box to sell for 8,000. I that makes sense. Yeah. I'm not seeing that. Um, I don't same, know what that's about. <laughs> same with and this Pele. And eight wow. eight thousand estimates. That makes no sense. Yeah, that that's just that's and I'm gonna be honest, I've I've now I've sold with Heritage and they told me like um because at one point Heritage was really oversaturated with some slabs that I would not consider super collectible. And right. I know it was kind of getting on, it was kind of annoying some of the collectors that were really some slabs that should have just been thrown on eBay were getting put up on Heritage. Um, so then when I went to heritage, they told me, oh, we're no longer taking any graded magazines unless they have a value of 1500 or higher. And I was like, man, like they, they wouldn't even take, I had a Michael Jordan first cover, the 83 one that we were talking about a 5.0. So not a high grade, but I tried to put that up on there. Cause I've also got an 8.0. So it was a duplicate for me and I was going to sell that five. They wouldn't even take a Michael Jordan first cover 5.0. When I yeah, talked to them. you, mentioned that to me in, in the past, uh, but they definitely have slabs up on this auction that are well below that, that threshold. Yes, I've noticed that. So they've they've obviously changed their stance on that. I don't I don't really know. But yeah, it is. I mean, it is nice to see, though. I mean, 2000 is a really strong bid for this Pele 9-2 subscription. Mm. Um, yeah. Seeing if there's anything else. We'll know. You got a you got a blank box LeBron 9.8. It's got a bid over a thousand right now. 
I mean, I can, I, I guess I can understand that one since it's a nine, eight, but yeah. Yeah. So I'm, a, yeah, I'm definitely, surprised by the Pele, to be honest. I mean, I know it's the Pele, it's a popular issue, but you could find those subscriptions somewhat regularly. I mean, look at this. I mean, this one right here, to me, this is a really collectible cover. This is Peyton Manning's, it's his third cover, if I'm not mistaken, but it's his first pro cover. And this is a nine, eight. Um, it, they're valuing it at $200. So that tells me, obviously, they're, yeah, they're accepting magazines that they think are worth less than 1500 now. You know, sometime, I wonder if there's a study out there that goes into placebo effect with these value estimates and what they actually go for. That's a good, that's a really good question. And they did tell me, so whenever I was selling, whenever I sold my one issue, I sold a, a Jordan uh, draft guide on there. Um, and then I was trying to sell the other, the 83 Jordan, but they told me that when it comes to estimates, they said, uh, the line of thinking used to be, oh, we're going to, we're going to place it really high. We're going to put the estimate really high and try and, you know, encourage people or make whatever, make people mm -hmm. think it's really valuable. But he told me, he said, but now he said, we try to be very realistic and we want to be conservative with the estimates that we list on there. So Take okay. That what it's worth. I mean, as in my opinion, as they should. I mean, they should be trying to be realistic. I think it's kind of leading the bidder a little bit if you have a five hundred dollars slab on there with a three thousand dollars estimate. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But it still just it kind of makes me wish that they would get a little bit more educated about our hobby because some of these estimates make zero sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that being said, I do appreciate that heritage you know, it has so many slabs, uh, slab magazines in their auctions in general. Um, I wish more auctions would start to adopt that as well. I agree. I don't, I don't mean to, to knock them at all. I did have a good experience selling with them. I was just, I was disappointed that they, sure. they didn't take a couple things that I thought were worthy. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously become the go-to place for key slabs. Uh, I've seen, Several collectors try and sell graded magazines on Golden with uh, subpar results. Yeah. I don't. I don't think Golden is getting many eyes on graded magazines right now. I think Golden is doing some other things pretty well right now. But um, if I were gonna put a big issue up for auction right now, I would. I mean, Heritage is obviously the way to go right now. Yep, agreed. All right. Mike, let's jump into our next topic. So let's go back to our agenda here. And why don't you lead this one off and, and let's talk a little bit about the uh, the recent effects on the pop counts. So I think it's fair to say that there's been a good influx of new graded slabs that have come to market from CGC um, over the past handful of months. And... Uh, I think that it's interesting to see which magazines have been affected by and which ones haven't and which prices are showing obvious changes because of it and which ones haven't. Um, it's it's still, it's sometimes there's, there's still a bit of a gray area here because I think that the general market is still so soft that we're seeing some mags that are not showing an increase in pop still continuing to come down. Uh, the Gretzky first cover is an example that I put aside here. Um, the Gretzky first cover, I we mentioned this in the last episode, we're starting to see a decline in some of the sales, um, but the pop hasn't changed very much, um, certainly in the past few months, but even in the past year, um, uh, high grades are nearly the, exactly the same as they were a year ago. Uh, but newer issues, um, uh, the Luca Trey first cover uh, that that we have seen a lot of new graded slabs of that issue come through in the past year, and that that was you know a very popular issue, um, and I, I think uh, an issue that was considered very collectible, and, I, and it probably should still be considered that. But there's so many new ones that have come to market that we're really seeing a, a significant drop in those prices. Um, let me see if I can give you a couple of numbers for that one. Uh, so you help me out with some of these numbers, actually. The Luca Trey first cover um, in 
grade. There's 94 of those. And a year ago, um, there was 65. So that that's quite that's quite a few of the, you know, there's quite a few added there in, the, in this past year. And um let's see it was six what, seven grades. Yeah, I mean, 65, 9.8s out of 71 total graded last year. And now there's 94, 9.8s out of 131 total graded. It's, it's, a, it's too high of a gem gem rate, as they say. You said yeah. there's there's 94, 9.8s of the Luca and Trey first cover right now? Out of 131 total graded. Yeah. So that's a very high gem rate. That's, that's yeah. very high, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I, when, when I was first jumping into this maybe six to eight months ago um a high grade of that i you know it cost a few hundred dollars and i think one a 9.4 in a straight up ebay auction i should probably uh double check that but i i believe it was like 50 some dollars that i went for yeah so I i think and and with that issue in particular i think part of that could be attributed to that um Trey Young has Trey Young had a pretty poor season and whereas a year or two ago I think people were really really high on him you know possibly being one of the next superstars he's the the love for him in the hobby seems to have cooled a little bit so that could have a little bit of effect as well certainly yeah and even Doncic I mean he actually had a, a brilliant season but uh his team did not yeah um so I think that the market has kind of cooled on him as well a little bit. Um, yeah, a, a 9.4 of the Luca trade cover sold for $53 in uh, August 2nd, yeah. a few days ago. So, yeah, I mean, so we, we know that CGC was basically moving at a snail's pace as far as getting back graded sports illustrateds. And it was taken well over a year to get them back. Um, they had built up this enormous backlog. And then whenever they released their new upgraded magazine slabs, which what was that? I want to say that was maybe March or maybe April of this year of 2023. Um, when they when they released those, they started working through the backlog and, and, and to their credit, they, they seem to really um, put an emphasis on it and they got through over a year's worth of backlog in several months. And we know that they now are totally through the backlog, right? Because I mean, me personally, I've sent in several, uh, several submissions just like in the past two months, um, you know, well after they had already released the yep. new slabs and well after they had already started working through the backlog. And I've already got those submissions back. So right. and unless, which is very possible, and unless they've, you know, skipped around and there are still a bunch from that backlog waiting to be graded, it seems to me like they've gotten through that. And so I know a lot of collectors were really waiting to see, okay, we talk so much about how rare these are, um, how low the pop counts are, but what's it really going to look like when CGC gets through this enormous backlog? And and now I feel like we have a pretty good picture of it. And, you know, you cited the example of the Luca and the Trey, and and I think that's a pretty substantial growth. Um, those pop counts jumped quite a bit, but I think you also can find a lot of examples, especially of the vintage um, yes where the pop counts even through this huge backlog that CGC worked through really haven't moved much and are still extraordinary lo extraordinarily low um you know when you consider how many magazines that they just went through and graded and and I just jotted down a couple little examples we just looked at that Pele first cover a minute ago Mike do you know or do you have a guess off the top of your head how many newsstands still as of today have been graded to that Pele first cover? Single digits. I'm not sure exactly. It's single digits. It's nine. It's still only at nine. Only nine newsstand copies have been graded. And then even the, uh, so the Muhammad Ali, the Cassius Clay first cover, which both you and I are in agreement that that's a top three cover all time um, as far as collectability. Um, there's only 29 newsstand copies that have been graded. Right. So, you know, I think I don't think we're ever going to see the pop counts in this hobby grow 
as much as they did in the past four months, because we're never going to, well, let's hope we're probably never going to be in another situation where CGC basically has a year's worth of thousands of issues that they have to work through super fast. Um, That's a great point. So I just, I think that, that, I think that the picture that we have of these pop counts now is pretty realistic. And from this point forward, um, grow any growth that we see in the pop counts especially in the vintage is going to be pretty minuscule. Uh, maybe that's not the case for the modern. I think the modern, some of these moderns are still going to continue to, you know, they could, they could jump quite a bit, but I don't see the vintage pop counts moving a ton from where they are now. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree. And that was definitely, that's a point that I wanted to make with that Gretzky there. Um, I, I'm just looking at the Wimbanyama, the Wimbanyama sales as well. Uh, 9.8 recently sold for $127, which is the lowest I've seen it sell for, I think, ever. Um, and this this ended on the 6th. And there's 44 9.8s of the Wembenyama. No, four, yeah, 44 9.8s of the Wembenyama out of 92 graded. Um, I saw that number shoot up immediately, like with that huge return. And... Even that, I, I feel, has kind of been sort of stagnant for the past month, at least, or so. Yeah. Um, that that may continue to grow a little bit further, however. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Any, so, you got any more thoughts on the pop counts? Uh, no, I mean, this just uh, solidifies what we already know about some of these vintage issues. And yeah, there's just so few. Yeah. And... And I don't want to get off on a total different tangent here, but because of what we're talking about and with these pop counts being so low on some of the vintage and the fact that we know that they're really hard to find and there's just not a ton out there. I mean, even when you compare when you compare the uh, the pop reports of some of these like key golden age comics, I mean, you've got you've got a bunch of them that have been graded two, three, four thousand times. Whereas, yeah. you know, like we talked about, I mean, you got the, the, the Muhammad Ali 29 times or the Mickey Mantle, I think is around 50, you know, I mean, these numbers are ridiculously low and it's hard for a hobby to build and, and um, generate interest from new collectors when, you know, it's so hard for them. It's, it's hard for people to go out and find some of these key issues. And so for that reason, and once again, I don't want to dive into this too far because this is a whole, really a whole episode, but I'm starting to come around more to the significance of subscription issues. Um, and specifically for the vintage, um, just because I think that it's the only way that a lot of people are going to be able to get into the hobby because not everyone can go out and immediately buy, you know, so-and-so's first cover in newsstand off of eBay. Um, yep. Most of the key people, most of the key athletes, their first covers are not available at all right now on eBay and newsstand, unless someone has one listed for probably a really high price. So if this hobby does take off, I think we're going to see the subscriptions dry up too for some of these vintage key issues. They're not super easy, as, as we were pointing out in, in the past, uh, for some of these key issues from you know decades ago, even in subscription, because they still have to survive several decades and they were so disposable for so long. Yeah. They're considered disposable. Yeah, exactly. I I think, you know, and and I've been guilty of saying this many times. Many times I have made the statement of, oh, there's there's thousands of of subscription copies out there. Uh and 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 actually I've probably even said millions. And that's because for most of these, there were there were millions, there were probably two or three million copies printed of many of these issues. But you just hit on a super key point, and that is that most people view magazines as disposable. And so even of the 3 million Michael Jordan first covers that probably were printed in subscription, how many of those are actually still alive? I mean, it's not, I, I don't think it's 1 million. I guarantee, I mean, and mm -mm. Yeah. it's, I, I don't know. I, I'm starting to think that they're actually a little bit 
Now they're still, they're still out there. You know, they're still, I would still consider them plentiful, but they're not, they're not just, uh, I don't think oversaturated. Like maybe I initially thought, and maybe I even initially talked about. Um, and I think that they're going to continue to play a bigger role. Um, Here's a, this is sort of a little example for you right now. The Cassius Clay first cover that we like to reference so often, uh, 29, you said, of the newsstand. That's yeah. likely not going to move a lot over, over the in the future. Maybe a, a little bit, but not much. Um, there's only nine subscriptions. Yeah. And, yeah. and, 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 and it, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, there's probably a pool of people that don't feel like subscriptions worth grading and that will push up if that if this hobby matures in that in that way. But uh, even so, I I wouldn't be surprised if that stays in the double digits even after, you know, some time has passed. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that because some of us in the hobby have been so vocal about, hey, you know, newsstands are the way to go. And they are. I think, I think newsstands are always going to be the premium value. Um, I'm not, I'm not putting that to the side. I think, I think that they're going to continue to command the highest value, but I think not a lot of people yet have really felt like they wanted to send subscription issues in to be graded. Um, But yeah, I think as, as the newsstand well continues to dry up as it already has significantly, you you got to look a lot harder to find them now than you used to. Um, more and more people are going to turn to subscriptions because that's going to be all there is available, at least at a reasonable price. Um, I also have I've seen some really nice looking covers with the label removed. There's there's some people out there that have gotten pretty dang good at removing the labels. I don't know that anyone's gotten good enough to where it can be totally done without CGC detecting it and without CGC you know, um, labeling it as a subscription, but certainly I've seen many examples now where the label is removed well enough to where it displays beautifully to where the untrained eye wouldn't even have any idea that a label was on there. And so I think that is pretty significant too. And, you know, when you hold it in your hands, it still feels like something that's lived a a life, you know, this magazine has still made it through those decades of being thrown around or put away, but it's still there. And and it still has the amazing. Still, still came out at the same time. Yeah. It still has the historical significant significance and the, and the cover photo. And so. One of the things that I love about vintage sports cards, especially the very old ones is that I like to think in my mind that at some point, there was some kid that had this in their collection and they were just like checking it out and really valuing like that Ted Williams 54 tops in their hand or whatever it might be. You know, I love the fact that it was, you know, uh, just like lived and, you know, and valued in just somebody's home and the subscription issues probably live that life. If not, you know, maybe more so than most newsstand issues, but certainly if they survived in high grade, probably the newsstand issues in high grade live the least, <laughs> you know, probably have the, the fewest stories to tell, yeah. you know, they're just kind of like tucked away in a dark room somewhere. And it's, it's amazing that they exist. Don't get me wrong. And they're beautiful. And I would always, always treasure them. But if you want to look at it in the other terms, it's that subscription issue that's, you know, that's probably been in that, you know, in different households and and loved by, you know, people as I, as I read them. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about Sports Illustrated, its future, um, and consider the possibility of, of if it, uh, if it would ever fold. So um, I'll, I'll start with this one, Mike. And, I actually want to, when talking on this topic, I want to consider the history. I want to go back a little bit first before we think about the future of Sports Illustrated. So we know that it started in 54, at least as a Time Inc. publication. There were two, there were actually two previous versions of Sports Illustrated, um, one in the 30s, one in the late 40s. I think the one in the 40s was published by Dell. Um, and but but Time Inc. purchased that title. They purchased the Sports Illustrated name and they launched it in 54. And it was weekly. Okay. It was weekly. 
Um, it was it was a non-profitable venture for the first 10 years or so. Sports Illustrated really struggled from, say, 54 to 64, somewhere around there. Um, took them a while to find their groove. They focused a lot on more upper class type, you know, not what we would consider the mainstream sports. And, and they kind of found their groove in, in the mid to late 60s and became an institution really by the 70s and uh, hugely popular in the 80s, hugely popular in the 90s get to the 2000s. Now we've got the internet. Uh, I think that's when, you know, they maybe started uh, to lose a little bit of popularity, but still pretty strong throughout the 2000s. And then, you know, things got pretty dicey in the 2010s. So it was, let's see, 20, uh, let's see, eventually they went bi-weekly and it looks like that was 2018. So actually in 2018, it it changed hands and, and Time Inc. sold it to uh, to someone else, Meredith Corporation. So really from 54 to 2018 was Sports Illustrated as we knew it. It changed hands. It became bi-weekly. It was only bi-weekly for a really short time. And then in 2019, it sold again and it became monthly. So, so Sports Illustrated still exists, but not in the form that we knew it, um, not in the way that we loved it. And I really, really question, honestly, with the way that digital has taken over digital media and digital news have taken over. I wonder how long it's actually going to be able to hold on in its current form. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a fair concern. Uh, we've seen other major publications change either change to digital or just fold. Um, you know, Playboy is a big one that went strictly digital, I believe. Um not, I'm not so sure of the of what other ones off the top of my head, but I, I'm sure that there's been quite a few. Um, yeah, it, you know, if I, I'm uh, I'm I'm not somebody that typically subscribes to once something is in the rearview mirror and no longer um, part of our day to day life, that it's going to automatically mean that it's be it's going to become a, irrelevant. And it's going to lose relevance, and nobody's going to care about it anymore. I've heard. I've heard people talk about that way with, you know, vintage um, or sports sports years from the past or vintage cards. And I've heard some people say that they think that vintage like uh, vintage cards are going to lose relevancy and value because the new people coming in aren't going to know who they are. And I don't I don't think that's true. I mean, uh, too many people love the history. People want to know about where things came from. People want to know origins. And, um, and, and, and that being the case, I think that sports, sports illustrated being an institution, like you said, is, is going to always have its place. That being said, you know, if it's, uh, if it ends up going digital or something, then we're, then we're talking about a finite, um, catalog of some of our favorite players to collect in, you know, in these, in these uh, sports illustrated magazines. So you will have a finite checklist. And if you're like a Kobe fan or you're a LeBron guy or whatever, or Michael Jordan, that's your finite list. And uh, I don't know, maybe it turns into something like Top Shot, which didn't work out so well so far. But uh, yeah, who knows? Yeah. And sadly, it already almost feels a little finite to me. Um, and And I think we need to acknowledge that this is one major, major difference from the sports card hobby. And you know, we, we love to compare the two hobbies. And with sports cards, there are dozens of new products coming out every single year um, of all the new players and all these different variations. And, you know, also there's the thrill of getting to rip the pack and not knowing what you're going to get. And and that's where this hobby is different because obviously there is no there is no thrill of ripping open a pack. You know what you're getting, you know what you're buying, but also there's just not there's not a lot of uh, new variety coming out. I mean, to me, the fun and the thrill of collecting the magazines is the historical piece, and it's all about it's all about the the old stuff, you know. Um, Which is why I think there's a lot there's a lot of collectors that are really into sports history that are involved in this hobby. Yeah. yeah also, I think another big aspect of magazine collecting, which I think is different from cards, is 
is the hunt. We're really we're mm -hmm. really engaged in the hunt because we feel like there's Easter eggs still out there and um, waiting to be discovered. And they are. We're, we're proved that that's the case all the time. And we're rewarded <laughs> when we find them. Right. Yeah. That's so. that's a great point. There are there are very few. I mean, you can look at the the pre-war stuff may may not fall into this category, but really there's there's not a lot of sports cards that if you really want it, you couldn't find it right now right. available Absolutely. somewhere. Yeah, but but like you said, the the hunt is real with the sports magazines and that is fun, man. It is it is so much fun. You know, I've now been I've on I've been on the hunt for for probably a year and a half. And when you track down and, and it's, it's not always, it's not always straightforward. It's not always just, Oh, it, Hey, it popped up on eBay. You know, I've got some, I've got some pretty cool stories about some of these different ways and methods and places that I've, I've found some of these magazines and uh, man, you, you get that in your hands. You, you discover that it truly is a new stand. You send it to CGC, you get it graded and slabbed. And it's a pretty amazing and fun feeling that I haven't, really gotten from sports cards yeah no i i agree i think that's one of the hooks that got in me you know when i first was turned on to this i was like oh there must be there must be a bunch of these on ebay that nobody's paying attention to <laughs> you know i go on there i'm like no no there's not <laughs> there were for a while but I think i'm sure there was before i joined the party i think yeah. it's, it's dried up pretty quick okay let's go to show and tell mike i know you really uh have some stuff you've been looking forward to sharing and so i'm gonna i'm gonna let you go first and i think the plan is we're each gonna show we're each gonna share or talk about you know if you're watching on video obviously we'll have images up uh but if you're listening we're just gonna talk about a couple unique covers that we own so mike go ahead and uh, share your first one with us Sure. Yeah. So I, I got a couple of submissions back recently, and among them was this um, Kurt Cobain um, tribute cover that People Magazine put out after his death, uh, his untimely death. There is a lot of tribute issues that came out. Some were a little bit more sensitive than others. This one I feel is mostly tastefully done. Some of them less so, which was kind of surprising. But you know, I guess they're in the business of selling magazines, but. This one I, I definitely like. Um, this is a pop two of any grade. And this is a pop one of one, none higher, at a 9.6. Um, Nirvana was a huge influence to me. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a musician as well. So uh, they were they were a huge influence to me and my music. Um, so I, I, I definitely grew up in that era. And, uh, you know, this this magazine came out 20 days after his passing. And, uh, and I think it's a it's a sharp cover. And uh, it's in my my little uh, tribute, you know, to, to my in my collection uh, to to one of my favorite musicians. Yeah, I, super historically relevant. I think that's a really cool one. And before you shared this one with me i it was not really a cover that was on my radar that i had ever seen before so i think it's really cool okay i had a hard time trying to decide what three to choose you know i i share all of my uh new slabs on on my channel um so i've i've picked out i've got Brad, before you start you might yeah, want to ch change the change the background to uh, the generic background so it doesn't take away from what you're sharing. Oh yeah. So I can go bigger screen. Yep. Yeah. As Good beautiful call. as it is. Yeah. Well, okay. Is that, you see me full screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I've got three, one of them is graded and, and I've, I've shared on my channel a long, long time ago and I'll share that one again, but the other two, I don't know that I've shown on my channel before this one I'm about to send in. And so um, this is Michael Jordan with the Wizards, but Mike, do you know any? Do you notice anything unique about this one? Is that in Spanish? This is in Spanish. So this is look. If do you see there right above Michael Jordan edition yes. Mexico? Yes. So this is Sports Illustrated uh, SI Mexico. Um, Michael Jordan versus Los Nuevos Valores. And uh, it's from 2001, Novi Noviembre 
2001. So I stumbled, I know I shared this with you, Mike, but um, I stumbled across a handful of SI Mexico's several months back and I purchased all of them and I'm, I'm about to send them all into CGC. I've almost got them all um, graded. They're not in great condition. I'm, I'm thinking all of them, like, honestly, I think this is probably like a six. Uh, they're pretty beat up. They travel. I bought them from Mexico. Like I bought these from a, from That's somebody awesome. in Mexico. Um, That's so cool. I didn't even know that this, that these existed. I knew that there was an SI Mexico because I, I know a lot of us collectors use that, uh, uh, sports illustrated issues.com super, super useful database in there. But if you look at the SI Mexico covers that they have listed, there's only like a, there's only a few. And so I didn't even like a bunch of these covers, including this one, weren't even listed on that website. So, uh, I was really, I thought it was, this was a really cool find that I'm kind of excited about. This is not the best one in this SI Mexico batch. There's one, especially that I was just like, my jaw dropped when I saw it. Not going to share that here. I'm going to wait until I get it graded and, and share it on my channel down the road. But yeah, I still I thought this was that one. pretty cool. I think that one's amazing. How many wizard covers does he have in general in the U.S.? Uh, two or three. Two okay. or three. I can't remember for sure. That's a great cover. Um, you know, uh, you're you're saying there's only a few of those listed in the census. You know, I just graded a handful of China ones recently. Mm -hmm. And they, the cert number comes up and I certainly have the slab, you know, but their census is just showing just a couple. And I know there's been more than just a couple of different issues. I'm still not sure what they're trying to do there <laughs> with their census. Yeah. I know that they, I know there were some, there were a handful of SI China's graded early on and like none of us could even find where yeah. CGC had put them in the census. Um, and, and no, actually the SI Mexico's none, none have been graded. Um, oh, and at all of any no, sort. There's, no, there's never been one graded. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, uh, and it, actually, I just looked, so I was wrong. There's been there were four U.S. Um, Michael Jordan, Jordan. Wizard, wizard covers. covers, but what I was talking about is like, so this is this is the website I was referencing. That if you're watching or listening to this and you have never checked this website out, SportsIllustratedIssues.com, super amazing database. And from all my research, I thought it was pretty comprehensive. I mean, they've even got like you can look at, uh, like I said, all these other, um, you know, S or here we go. SI on campus, SI for women, SI Latino. There was an SI Mexico. But like, look, if I click on this SI Mexico, they only had three issues listed on here. So as far as I knew, that's all that there was. But I've got 10 in my room right now that are not on here. Mm -hmm. And none of these. So this is not complete. No, this is not complete. And um, and none of them have ever been graded before. So I thought that was really interesting. Well, well, if you're a Michael Jordan collector or a completist, I can't see how you can ignore these. Yeah. Or anybody. I'm a LeBron collector. So I picked up a bunch of his China ones. I think they're amazing. I agree. Those Chinas are awesome. They're really cool. Yeah. Those are a lot of fun. All right. So my turn. Okay. Yeah. So um I'm I'm I guess the theme of my show and tell are these tribute issues. Um, but they're they're so in some cases they're so well done. Uh this one's just beautiful in my opinion. Um yeah, so he he had a Kobe had a handful of different tribute issues that came out by different publications, but this one's my favorite one. I'm a sucker for black and white. I love the dramatic feel of it all. Um, this one came out a couple of weeks after the tragic, uh, the accident of, of he and his daughter, uh, Deanna, unfortunately. Um, so celebrates Kobe. Um, he was a, we know he, he was accolades, five-time champion, um, Academy Award winner. Um, this is a, in a 9.6, this is a pop 15 with 18 higher, 70 total in newsstand graded. Um. Yeah. Uh. I, I. I'm looking at my notes here, and uh, <laughs> I wrote find. I find the cover to be a bit of a deserved exhale for a nonstop life of grind, determination, and achievement. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I agree with that thought. Um. 
there's something kind of peaceful about it. But uh, I think it's a beautiful cover. Yeah, you you know my love for Kobe, so I I love this cover. Believe it or not, I do not have one of these graded or raw. Um, for whatever reason, just have never never snagged one. Um, but yeah, I mean this is I mean when Kobe died, that was, honestly that was one of the worst days of my life because like growing up, Kobe was like my whole childhood. Just like watching the games, wearing his jersey, playing his Nintendo 64 game. I mean, collecting his cards, having his posters on my wall. I mean, so that, yeah, I I think that cover is uh, pretty, pretty awesome. It, it obvi- I, this is lame, but that cover kind of makes me a little bit emotional, to be honest with you. No, that was, that was, uh, that was such a shock when that happened. He, you know, he, he had so much to to offer. Um, obviously, he, he had so much to offer the game, but he did nothing halfway. He was already doing so many interesting things after his basketball life. Um, you know, as I mentioned, he he won the Academy Award for the Deer Basketball um, animated film that he put together. And who knows what else he was going to do in his next ventures? Well. Probably some people know, but I, I, my point is that, you know, he, he had a lot left and he, he had a lot to give and um, really an, an interesting, an interesting uh, person. Yeah, for sure. All right. So my number two is I've got this, this is a 1979 Missouri Valley conference uh, program guide with Larry Bird on the cover in his uh, Indiana State jersey, and I've got it autographed in silver sharpie there by Larry. Um, so I grew up and still am. I'm a huge fan of the Missouri Valley Conference basketball, primarily because I live right down the road from Southern Illinois University, the the SIU Salukis. Uh, they produced Walt Frazier. They had um, a great run in the early 2000s from 02 to 07, six straight NCAA tournaments, couple sweet 16s. So I'm super, super familiar and close to the Missouri Valley Conference, have always been very aware of, you know, Larry Legend and his, you know, uh, stamp on not only the Missouri Valley Conference, but the NCAA as a whole. And so I stumbled upon this. This was actually, this was on some random, this was on a website for some random like um, hobby shop in Indiana and they had some stuff available online. And I saw this and, you know, being the, the um, magazine collector that I am, I thought it was incredible. It's just the, the color and then the shot of Larry, you know, still in his college uniform, I loved it. And in my very first thought, and I'm not even really much of an autograph guy, but my very first thought was, I have to get this autographed. And so I searched for any uh, Larry Bird signings, and there was one coming up in uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, like a couple months after I received this. And I was able to uh, send it in and and paid for, for Larry's autograph. I think it was 150 bucks, but uh, for me, well worth it for this legend and came out yeah, beautiful. beautiful. So yeah, I really like this one a lot. That's really interesting that you're able to find signings. I figured that there were cer- certain personalities that are just not a part of that game anymore for because they just don't need it. You know, they. I was surprised to find him as well. Huh. Amazing. Very cool. Okay, so this one is a favorite of both mine and my girlfriend. My girlfriend is a big Yogi Berra fan. So I am too. Um, this is a pop one of one with none higher. Um, only two of these have been graded at all in a newsstand in any condition. Uh, the other being a 6.5. This was one that I found in the, in the wild. So it was, you know, pretty special. Um, you know, Yogi is, he's Yankee royalty. Um, this this depicts him in his return to the Yankees as a manager in 1984, uh, which he was actually quite a good, he was quite good. Um, he, uh, I believe he had 80 some wins in that season. And then the next season, he uh, his team, the Yankees start off a little slow and 
George Steinbrenner went ahead and fired him after 16 games. Um, this sort of, you know, story where he he fires Yogi Berra, which is like, um, it just seems unthinkable. And blasphemy. He, he didn't even do it. It's blasphemy, right? He didn't even do it. He, had some, he sent somebody in to do it, which <laughs> blew his mind. And it blew Yogi's mind, too, because Yogi was estranged because of this reason. For 18 years, he didn't set foot in Yankee Stadium despite being asked for different occasions. Um, but because, well, and he said that he would not do it until Steinbrenner apologized to him, which was eventually done 18 years later because, you know, strong-headed people are here. And uh, and then he eventually, thankfully, was brought back into the fold and, and honored. And there's a yogi, I think there's a Yogi Bear to actually – there's a new documentary out where they go into this pretty, you know, in, in depth and uh, they have this Yogi Berra day, you know, Yogi Berra caught that perfect game in the world series. The only perfect game in the world series, right? Uh, Don um, Larson. Don Larson's perfect game. And they, on Yogi Berra day, they had Don Larson throw out a pitch to Yogi. Right. And the catcher Girardi, who mm-hmm. would later become mm-hmm. the manager, I believe, asked Yogi, can I use your glove for this game? For good luck, and Yogi gave him the glove, and that was David Cohn's perfect game. No way! Isn't that crazy? Is that I real? I've never heard stuff. that. Yeah, I when I was watching that in the documentary, I was like, "Really? That happened?" You're telling Why? me that David Cohn's perfect game was caught by Joe Girardi using the same glove that Yogi used for Don Larson's World Series perfect game. Well, now you're making me feel like an idiot. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I just, <laughs> double, that's amazing. I've never heard that story before. That, that's what the documentary showed us. So I'm make a, hey, I'm looking, if that is true, I'm making a video about that. Cause that's the coolest thing I've never heard. Isn't it? Yeah. How is this not talked about more? And also how is it not talked about what catchers, how many, how many perfect games did, the, did you catch? They talk about how many perfect games and no hitters were pitched by which pitchers, and that's celebrated. But the catchers are making the whole thing go. Yeah. Why is that not a thing? You know, um, hey, Yogi Berra ca- caught a perfect game. That should be a bullet point right there. Hey, if anyone appreciates a good catcher, it's me as a St. Louis Cardinals Yadier Molina fan. So I say Yogi three-time MVP definitely deserves more credit, more love than he gets today. Absolutely. Roy yeah. Campanella as well. Yeah, I agreed. Okay. My last one is, like I said, I have shared this one before, but it's been quite a while. So some newer people may not have seen it, but this is, this is a Kobe Bryant. Yes. Um, we were talking about this one actually today, Mike. This is an older slab. So I'm actually, the reason I chose this one is because it was laying out because I'm about to send it in to be re-slabbed because it does have, um, it's got a little bit of a chipping here and there's like a loose piece floating around, which drives me crazy. I never felt comfortable uh, doing the re-slab because I've always been worried. Like I know in sports cards, like you can, you could very well easily get a lower grade, but I recently was looking through the CGC website and I don't know if this is new language or what, but it specifically says on there something like um, as long as the interior of your magazine is not, or the interior of your slab is not damaged, like that magazine itself is not damaged. You should receive the same grade that you got before. And so the language that they put on there makes me feel a little bit more comfortable to send this in than I ever had felt before. So I'm going to go ahead and get this re-slabbed because I, I want the, I mean, this slab sucks anyway, and then I want the newer one that's sturdier. Um, but the thing I love about this one, it's it's a 9.2. It's kind of faded. Um, this was one of my very first slabs that I bought. I did not buy it raw. Um, I bought it already graded. I think I want to say that I want it in an eBay auction for like 150 bucks. And oh, I don't man. even know if at the time I realized the relevance of it. Um, I I knew that it was the highest graded. So this is the highest graded copy of this Kobe issue. But I don't know that I understood the magnitude of this was a, you know, there were six regional covers this week. Uh, Kobe, LeBron, Dwight Howard, Kevin Durant, Elton Brand. And um, I can't remember who the sixth was, but um, 
you know, only only a, a select region, probably, you know, the Southern California, whatever Southwest region got this Kobe cover. Uh, and it was probably only available in newsstands in that region. And so it's it's that much harder to find. And um, and to me, it's one of the most beautiful Kobe covers. I love the yellow background with the color match and just great uh, up up close focus of Kobe. Uh, I think it's the hardest. I think it's the hardest Kobe cover that there is to find in newsstand. And so, to have the highest graded copy, really proud of this one. This is definitely one of the, you know, one of the jewels in my collection. And especially as I talked about earlier, being such a huge Kobe fan that I am. That's my favorite Kobe SI for sure. And I do hope to find the LeBron in that same, that from that same uh, week as well at some point in newsstand. I hope. They're tough. I I, They're tough. I look for that LeBron as well, just because I I recognize the the significance and the value that it could have if I were to ever find one. Okay, well, Mike, I think probably glancing at the clock, um, I think we've probably hit about the length of time that we're shooting for on this episode. So uh we've got a really awesome draft lined up. You know, we we each chose our our top five covers. Sports Illustrated covers that depict historical moments, but uh, if you're okay with it, I'm kind of thinking that we we push that back as well as our other topics to the next episode. Um, you know what? I can go either way. It's 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 up to you. What do you what do you think? Do you want to let's wanna try? Let's keep wanna, let's keep the people let's keep the people on their toes. Let's hold it for our next one. All right. Well, they have something special to look forward to then. Exactly. Now now you know that the people listening right now are going to tune in for the next episode because they got to know what covers we chose. Sounds good. Okay. Well, I feel like we talked about a, a good range of stuff tonight. Um, showed off some of our, some of our slabs and talked about why they, why they mean something to us and um, kind of, I don't know. I, I have fun talking about this stuff. I, I thought that it went well and I enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I always enjoy talking uh, mags with you. Uh, you know, it's it, it's a it's a good time, and uh, you know, these things are endlessly intriguing to me. Definitely, and just uh, an update for those listening and watching. I had mentioned in the last episode that we we're planning on live streaming. Um, still planning on doing that, but I hit a I hit a hiccup on that. Uh, right before we did this episode. So still planning on live streaming future episodes. And um, hopefully we will be able to announce that ahead of time uh, before the before the upcoming episode. And so we can let people know when we're going to live stream. And then that way, if you're free and want to hop on the chat, ask us some questions or, you know, bounce back some comments and some feedback, we can make it a little bit interactive. That's kind of the goal. And we're still planning on doing that. But um, just want to let people know that's why we didn't do it this time, but it's it's still where we're hoping to go. I thought also I mentioned real quick, this is this is available on audio podcast. It's now available on Apple Podcast. It's available on Spotify, and I believe it is now available in Google Podcast as well. Nice. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So share it with your friends. Get everybody into this hobby because it's awesome. Thank you for listening, and um, we'll see you on the next episode.